a computer animation of Mars as seen in space. Is there life on Mars? Has there ever been? In an old movie, a shuttle lands on Mars. People celebrate in a control room. These questions have inspired science and science fiction alike. A book page appears. Text reads, War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. Next, a rover with six wheels moves slowly on sand. But a mission, led by the European and Russian space agencies, might finally reveal what really lies beneath the surface of the Red Planet. The Red Planet Mars appears on black on the right-hand side. Titles on the left-hand side read, Natural History Museum, Cutting Edge, The Search for Life on Mars. In a cartoon, a round spaceship flies with a flourish from Earth to Mars. We've been sending missions to Mars since the 1960s to find out what, if anything, could survive there. A timeline chart appears. In 1976, the Viking 1 lander made history as the first spacecraft to successfully land on another planet. 20 years later, Mars Pathfinder was better able to explore the surface as the first mission to use a rover alongside a lander. More recently, the twin rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, have proved that the surface may once have been covered in oceans and lakes. And in 2018, the Curiosity rover found evidence of organic molecules, the raw building blocks for life. However, no signs of life have yet been confirmed. But an upcoming mission could change that. The timeline stops at 2020. The rover is in a large space with sand on the ground. It changes its height by pivoting the wheels. The machine boasts five solar panels on top and a long mast. This is the ExoMars rover. It will be the most advanced rover sent to Mars. It's being developed just north of London by Airbus in a purpose-built Mars yard. Man tests the rover using a laptop. The Mars yard is a, a simulated Martian environment. It has the right sands and rock types that we expect to encounter on Mars, which we then use to develop our prototype rovers. The man sits on a prop. Behind him is the rover and another version of it that includes the chassis and the mast. Caption reads, Paul Meacham, lead systems engineer, Airbus. We're very much in the age of the rover. We don't really know where on Mars is most interesting to take samples and look for signs of life. So we want to use rovers rather than landers to cover as much distance as we can and try lots of different scientific sites. The rover's intricate metal wheels squish into the sand as the robot spins on the spot. We design a rover to be able to drive long, long, long distances on Mars. There are two main challenges uh, that we have to design around. The first of these is the uh, thermal environment. The temperature range on Mars can go between 10 degrees in the day to minus 130 degrees at night. The electronics that sit inside our rover and control everything, they don't like it at the very low temperatures and we have to design an environment on board that isolates the electronics from these extremes of temperature. The second is dust, particularly for a solar-powered mission like ours. Pictures of a dusty Martian landscape appear. Text reads, Curiosity Rover Composite Images. Dust storms on Mars tend to be sort of peaking around the Martian winter. And so the simple way to, to design a mission around them is to land just after the Martian winter in, in the Martian springtime. They will be uh, something we'll have to deal with eventually, but the idea is that we've achieved all our scientific goals by then. On top of the rover's mast is a camera. The navigation of the rover and the way it is able to move around is actually really important because uh, the time delay between Earth and Mars can be as bad as 20 minutes. So it's either really inefficient to drive it by remote control or it's actually dangerous. So instead we've designed our rover to be as, as autonomous as we possibly can to the point where all it needs is the target we want it to reach. Uh, we tell it nothing about the terrain, we tell it nothing about the best route to take. Everything else is done on board. One of the rover's metal wheels climbs over a flat, grey, oval-shaped rock. The navigation cameras at the top of the mast, uh, they see in 3D, and that allows the rover to determine where the rocks and the slopes are in front of it. If any of those rocks are too big or the slope is too steep, that area will be marked as forbidden and the rover will not go anywhere near it. There's also quite an interesting feature in the locomotion system called trajectory control. If we start to get disturbed from the path we're trying to follow because of the nature of the terrain, the system realises that is happening and will bring us back onto the path we're trying to follow. That's more efficient but it's also safer for the rover as well. 
We have a really flexible locomotion system uh, in that we can actually steer and drive all six wheels at the same time. The rover's wheels move independently on the spot. This allows us to follow a curve, crab sideways, spin on the spot, and we can actually do a combination of these geometries to achieve different effects whilst we're driving. That's something that no other rover has been able to do to date. To know where to go, the rover will need a pair of eyes. Luckily, the Mullard Space Science Laboratory is up to the challenge. A man wearing glasses sits in an office. To his left is a globe of Mars before desertification. Caption reads, Andrew Coates, Deputy Director, MSSL. We're working on the ExoMars PanCam, the panoramic camera system. So this, this is the scientific eyes of the, of the rover. So this will actually be able to do some geology and some atmospheric science. On a desk, among other electronic equipment, is a long rectangular white housing. On it, three lenses and a circuit board are visible. It uses a combination of cameras to be able to do that. Andrew shows an empty model of the white housing. Yes, yeah, so this is um, the PanCam optical bench. So that's the thing which houses all the camera systems. So it has two apertures here, um, each of those for the two wide angle cameras. And this is the high resolution camera aperture. Um, and so PanCam is inside this optical bench and the real thing is, is sealed on Mars. So the rover is going to be drilling underneath the surface of Mars for the first time to look for signs of life. But to do that, you've got to decide where to drill. So we have context instruments. So PanCam is the most important of those. Uh, but there are several others. As well as PanCam, there's the infrared spectrometer, there's a close-up imager, uh, there's a subsurface sounding radar, there's a neutron detector, and there is also a little uh, camera inside the drill tip. In a computer animation, the rover deploys its drill, which penetrates the planet's red soil. The ExoMars rover will be the first mission to drill deep down into the Martian surface. It will drill two metres down to where scientists believe there may be a layer of permafrost. This is where they'll look for evidence of life in the past, or even life today. The rover retracts the drill and stores a sample in a small drawer. What we do is get the sample from underneath the surface, bring it up to the rover and put it inside what's called the analytical drawer. And then there are three more instruments inside of there which will analyse the sample. So that combination, um, the context instruments, tell you where to drill. And then once you've drilled, we look at um, analysing the sample. In the test lab, the rover raises its height. We're not expecting to find things like dinosaur bones, for example. Next, a dark-haired man speaks while seated at a desk. To his right is a globe of Mars before desertification. Caption reads, Joel Davis, researcher, NHM. Potentially going to be things like traces of fossilised bacteria. A globe of present Mars shows the landmarks, meridians and parallels. All the instruments, robotics and computing power mean nothing if the rover doesn't land in the right place. So experts at the Natural History Museum have joined an international effort to figure it out. Choosing where to land on Mars is actually quite a challenge because we want to land on the really old parts of Mars where we think we stand the best chance of finding traces of uh, past life. But these regions also tend to be pretty high, so there's less atmosphere to slow a rover down as we uh, descend towards the surface of Mars. So it's really about finding a balance between somewhere uh, that's relatively low and somewhere that's relatively old. Uh, so we're landing uh, in this uh, region, Northwest Arabia Terra here, because it's actually quite near the, the hemisphere divide on Mars, where the southern highlands, the old part of Mars, borders the northern lowlands, the young part of Mars. So this region here has the advantage of being relatively low down, so there's enough atmosphere, uh, but is also relatively old. Margin for error and where we're, where we're actually going to land, it's about 100 kilometers or so. Uh, so we need to be very, very sure that the entire area across these two sites, across the entire landing area, is, uh, is safe for the rover to land and safe for it to explore, but also that there's going to be good science to do wherever we land uh, within the sites. The thing I'm most worried about, I guess, is the landing. The time delay is as much as sort of seven minutes at that point. Uh, it tends to get referred to as the seven minutes of terror. And thus, the, the landing system has to be able to land the rover safely or without any interaction from Earth. Earth will only find out if it's landed, as say, seven minutes after it either has or hasn't on the surface. So that would be quite a, quite a, a nervous time. The landing sites are selected uh, in sort of a balancing act to make sure that the rover can deal with the environment that it will encounter once it lands on Mars. And inevitably, most of the scientifically interesting sites are the hardest to get to. The two sites where the rover could potentially land are called Mars Vallis uh, and Oxia Planum. And both sites are covered in clay minerals. Uh, clay minerals are important because we think they form, uh, they form in water on the Earth. So we think that four billion years ago, these clay minerals at the two sites uh, formed somehow in liquid water. And we think that they would potentially be good at preserving uh, signs of life, so organics. 
To help inform the ExoMars mission, scientists have been working with some pieces of Mars that we have right here on Earth. So the museum has one of the best collections of Martian meteorites, we think, in the world, because it's quite a, a diverse collection. A blonde woman presents several dark-coloured meteorite samples. Caption reads, Sarah Russell, researcher, NHM. The, the kind of cream of the meteorite collection for Martian meteorites is this one here called Nakla, which fell about 100 years ago in Egypt. In the 1980s, uh, researchers at the museum found that it actually contains traces of water, and this was the first evidence that the planet Mars actually uh, has water on it. A computer animation of Mars rotating slowly on its axis in space. It's one thing to find water on Mars, but life? One of the really big questions is whether there's uh, life on Mars, because once we did think it was, was much warmer and wetter, and so it might have been habitable. A newspaper page appears, title reads, Ancient Life on Mars. In 1996, a group of researchers uh, published evidence uh, for fossilised bacterial type life. They found these little fossil morphologies uh, in a meteorite called Allen Hills 84001. Uh, and we now think the, these little, um, little wormy things they found were probably not fossilised Martian life, but it's really invigorated the debate. And absolutely, one day we might find that, that uh, that evidence that, uh, that we've been looking for, that there was life on Mars. Next, back to Andrew Coates. Other rovers started off looking for water and following the water, now looking at habitability. But we're going right to the heart of the question of was there life there? Paul Meacham. My feeling is, is that Mars was formed around the same time as the Earth, in a similar part of the solar system where water can exist as a liquid. Um, and if our assumptions about what life needs are correct, then in theory we should find it next door. I think it'll be of sort of bacteria level of life. It's the most hardy form of life we have on Earth. Um, so if we do find it, it'll be that. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm fairly confident we will find what we're looking for. Yes. Joel Davis. Mars probably had the conditions for life four billion years ago. Uh, so whether or not life, has evol life evolved there is an interesting question. Two planets within a solar system both hosting life is, is quite a good sign for perhaps life elsewhere in the universe. A computer rendition of Mars slowly zooms out from its equator. Ultimately, that's what's most exciting about the ExoMars mission. If we find life on Mars, there's no limit to where else in the universe life has found a way. Next, a young woman speaks. We hope you enjoyed that video. Don't forget to share it and subscribe to our YouTube channel. You'll also find loads more amazing content on the Space Hub on our website. Video credits are displayed on a narrow, semi-opaque grey rectangle on the left-hand side. Film Callum Mare, Science Airbus Defence in Space, Mullard Space Science Laboratory, Natural History Museum. Voice over, Gabriella Contaridis. Production team, Kerry Lotsoff, Duncan Gregory, Eddie Taylor, Edward Johnston. Editing, Vito Malazzo. Animation, Adrian Sherwin. Archive stills, NASA. Music, Audio Network. Thanks to Ari, Kate Priestman, David Levi, Mark Dollery. On the right-hand side, the words Natural History Museum are displayed in the column flanked by large letter N on the left. Text at the bottom reads, copyright owned by the trustees of the Natural History Museum London.